Good evening. I'd like to welcome you all here tonight. Um, my name is Michael Stingel. I'm a professor in the philosophy department here at the University of Lethbridge, and I'll be introducing the panel and uh, tonight's topic. Uh, first of all, to begin, uh, the University of Lethbridge would like to acknowledge that we are gathered on the lands of the Blackfoot people of the Canadian Plains, and it also would like to pay respect to the Blackfoot people past, present, and future while recognizing and respecting their cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. The University of Lethbridge is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. We're here tonight following up on last week's public professor talk by Hester Yiskot. Uh, it was a talk on glaciers, and uh, it was a talk on a bit more than glaciers. It was a talk on how glaciers are affected by climate change and how they in turn are affecting climate change. Uh, so it was about a socially important topic, uh, but looking at scientific aspects of, of that particular topic. And so our topic tonight is the role of science in, in public decision making. What role does it play? So we've got you here as the public, so thank you very much for coming. And we've got some scientists, we've got some policymakers, uh, and we have a, a philosopher of science, somebody who worries about what exactly scientific evidence it is and why it might be particularly worthy of, of belief. So let me just go along from Hester Yiskot, whom we saw last week uh, talking about glaciers and climate change. Um, so uh, somebody who studies glaciers here at the University of Lethbridge. Sitting next to her is Dr. Dr. Uh, Robert Gruninger, somebody who is interested in agricultural science and animal science, in particular, ruminant digestion. Um, so uh, how cattle become fat and happy and also how uh, they produce methane gas and how we can get more of the former and less of the latter. So somebody working around animal science and, and issues having to do with climate change. I just need to know where people are actually sitting. <laughs> sitting next to him is uh, Idum Salgasi. Uh, she's a climate change coordinator for the Blood Tribe Management Environmental Protection Division. Uh, she's somebody with a degree in environmental sciences from the University of Lethbridge and someone who's interested in combining uh, Western scientific knowledge with uh, indigenous ways of knowing when it comes to the environment and indigenous values around the environment. So someone more in the area of public policy, but, but mixing policy with values with science from both a Western perspective and, and a Blackfoot perspective. Uh, Stuart Rood, sitting next to her, uh, is a professor here of biology, somebody who's interested in uh, river environments and floodplain environments. Uh, so someone who's a plant scientist, but also interested in how these environments change and are affected by climate change. Uh, sitting next to him is Shannon Frank. Uh, she's the executive director of the Old Man River Watershed Council. Oops, sorry, the Old Man Watershed Council. I guess it's tied up with the river, so it's a good thing you're sitting next to the person who studies rivers. Um, someone who's interested in mixing science with values in terms of, of thinking about best outcomes. So somebody who's thinking both about the science, but both how they fit into thinking about values and, and cultural ideas and cultural change. Um, last is Professor Bryson Brown, uh, the philosopher that I mentioned. You might wonder, well, why is a philosopher sitting on this panel? And the quick answer is one of the things philosophers worry about is what makes for good evidence? Why is scientific evidence particularly good evidence? And, and why does evidence matter in, in public discussions around things like, like climate change? So we'll start off the evening. Your moderator is Dr. Craig Cooper. He's the Dean of Arts and Science. Uh, he's got a couple of questions to get the panel talking so you get a chance to hear from, from each panelist. And then we'll be opening up for public discussion. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'd like to welcome you tonight to um, tonight's panel discussion. Um, so first of all, I'd like to give an opportunity to hear from each one of the panelists before we open the floor up. And so as Michael has said, we have a couple um, broad questions to start the conversation. And so I'll begin starting with Hester and then we'll work through and I'll ask our panelists um, to give their answers um, concisely as possible. So three to five minutes. So our first question is, 
what are the major present and near future effects of climate change in your field? Hester, why don't you take it away? So my field is glaciers, and the glaciers are rapidly disappearing. They're thinning and getting shorter. And because of that, the water is first getting into the river, so the water in the river levels is first higher because of that. But eventually, the glaciers shrink so that we have less fresh water in our rivers. That water goes into the sea, so the consequence of that is sea level rise. But while these glaciers melt, there's also a release of some what we call legacy pollutants and some contaminants that we put in the atmosphere maybe in the 60s, 70s, and are now melting out. So the downstream communities sometimes have problems with pollution of that. Um, with glaciers melting, there's a lot of hazards related to that. There's rivers that actually end up being dammed as a lake, and these lakes can burst out, can destroy a lot of the villages downstream. There's a lot of rock slides that happen from the valley walls that are suddenly like completely open and exposed that sometimes run out so far over the glacier that they re reach big cities, and we've had thousands of deaths from such types of rock slides. And then another hazard is that some of the glaciers that end in oceans produce icebergs. And if they melt back really fast, there's more icebergs. And we all know what happened to the Titanic. So <laughs> uh, some of these icebergs actually like, reach the east coast of Canada too. And then finally, when glaciers melt, they also influence the climate themselves. So if the Greenland ice sheet, which has a lot of fresh water, melts, that water into the North Atlantic, it disrupts some of the ocean currents. And that has a big effect on a lot of the climate in the Northern Hemisphere. So I'll keep it to that. Good. Richard, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so my area is microbiology of the gut in cattle. And I think what we've seen recently over the last few years here in Southern Alberta and Saskatchewan, uh, with the lack of water and problems generating enough feed for cattle, producers are starting to look at ways that they can use um, feeds that they haven't used before. So there's a lot of research uh, going into how do we more efficiently use things like crop byproducts, so straws. Can we uh, replace some of the higher nutritionally nutritional value feeds with lower nutritional value feeds while maintaining the efficiency of the animal. Um, the other area is um, there are companies now that are starting to develop in feed methane inhibitors. So as animals digest their food, um, one of the byproducts of that is methane. And that's not just cattle, that's all, all people. We all generate methane. Um, so I'm looking at how are these methane inhibitors working? Um, what do they do to the microbial community in the gut? And does that impact um, the health and the efficiency of the animal? Thank you. Our next panelist. Uh, lean <clears throat> into the mic, you'll need to lean in. Okay, Idamik Shistsuko. So my field of work, I'm the climate change coordinator for Agan Out, and that's the blood reserve. It's just a little southwest of here. And a lot of the major effects of climate change is large-scale weather events. And those disproportionately affect indigenous peoples due to the past of colonization. Already we're at this lower socioeconomic level per capita on reserves versus off reserves. So I'm looking at adaptation versus mitigation. So adaptation is adapting to climate change, adapting to these large scale weather events uh, versus mitigation, which is looking at bringing down greenhouse gases. Whereas First Nations reserves don't really produce that much greenhouse gases. Um, that go into climate change. But then as well, another part of adaptation is looking at how policy is leaving out Indigenous people and how we can sit at the table, how we can braid our Indigenous knowledge into this Western climate change policy. Because for so long, for 150 years, we've been left out. And here we are, 150 years 
this is where our climate is. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. Thank you. Stu, do you want to? Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Dean Cooper. Um, nice to see some friends uh, in the audience here. And also nice to follow Deandra and, and Rob. And um, so in terms of climate change, most of you have heard of global warming. And, and global warming is a certainty. The data are pretty clear. Over the last century, things have warmed up. Actually, in southern Alberta, they haven't really warmed so much as they've gotten less cool. So that the winter is not as harsh as it used to be. And in particular, the low temperatures are not as frequent as they used to be. But while global warming um, is pretty well established, it's really the impact on water that's going to affect us in southern Alberta, including, of course, the, the Kainai Reserve and, and agriculture. And so I'm interested in how climate change is influencing water patterns, and particularly river flows. Um, I can give you the very short summary, and that is that we're not exactly sure. But if we look at the last 100 years of records, two things are happening. Um, with winter warming, we're getting a little more rain in the winter, a little less snow in the winter. Snowpacks are declining. And spring is coming earlier. Maybe that's a good thing some years. But it's a problem because if spring comes earlier, then the summer has less water. And so summer flows are declining. And the summer, when it's hot and dry, is when the trout are most stressed, when the trees are most threatened, when irrigation is in the greatest demand. And so um, relative to my interests, and I think all of our interests, we want to know more about how our water resources are changing um, how the natural reservoir, uh, Hester talked about glaciers, and especially snowpack, is declining. And relative to that, to some extent, we're, we're somewhat fortunate in southern Alberta in that we have quite extensive infrastructure relative to um, reservoirs. And um, I think we're going to have to use these more wisely in the future to some extent to compensate for some of the challenges that face us. Thank you, Stu. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming out tonight. It's good to see so many folks that I know. Um, I'm a graduate of the University of Lethbridge, so proud to be here with some of the professors that taught me. It's good to see you guys. Um, I knew some of the other folks were going to talk about um, water and, and the watershed and glaciers and stuff, so I wanted to focus on people. Um, because at the Watershed Council, our work is really people work. And what we do is we bring people together to discuss solutions and really get to work on solutions. And so um, the thing I wanted to bring up about um, effects of climate change in our field is more about how it's going to impact people. And the one big way that's going to impact us and what we're seeing is anytime there's a big controversial subject, <laughs> like climate change is that it divides people and that's a really bad thing for um, groups like ours trying to inspire collective action and you know group effort and things like that um, and we see we've seen this before with other issues like the castle parks recently where there's this backlash against environmental initiatives and against um, conservationists and people who work in the environmental field um, and that's been a, a big problem and a big um, unexpected challenge, I think. You know, people weren't really thinking, you know, environmentalism would become a dirty word and would be something you don't want to mention, you know, to your family or at the dinner table and things like that. So I think that's a big issue facing us with climate change is how it's dividing our communities and how it's keeping us from working on solutions because we're too busy arguing about it and um, you know pointing fingers at each other and and um, not not getting on with the work of, of actually doing something about it thank you Bryson philosophers can approach this in in a couple of ways and and I'll tell you a little bit about both of first uh, there's there's the pure philosophy of science approach and and when it comes to pure philosophy of science, climate models are a wonderful example of a new kind of science that's emerging uh, in which we use very reliable, well understood theoretical principles to build extremely complicated, rich models. And, and we're finding that we're actually able to do that quite successfully, that, that climate modeling in particular is, is a very good example of that kind of work. And philosophers are very interested in the logic of that because it's clear in these cases, you, you cannot give a full, complete description of the state of the Earth's climate or the state of the Earth's weather at any instant. All you can give is some numbers reflecting uh, local values here, local values there, scattered across a grid, and you can 
take that kind of data and try to uh, model how that current weather state will evolve over time or how a current climate state will evolve over time as CO2 levels increase and as more heat is being retained by the Earth's system as it comes in from the sun and fails to escape as rapidly, as easily as it used to. And uh, the, the logic of some of those, um, some of those um, uh, models of, of climate is, is extremely interesting. Uh, one particular one that I've actually worked on involves uh, looking at um, global climate models and then using them to drive a, a, a finer grid regional climate model. And what happens is that you actually have to translate data as calculated in the, in the global model and use it to drive or push the regional model to get some idea of what might happen in that region over time. This is work that's going on right now in Quebec as they're looking at possible changes in rainfall, in maximum rainfall, in maximum spring melt, which will make a very large difference to how they manage waterway, waterways, dams, and so on. And uh, they expect changes and they're trying to prepare for them. And I've worked on the logic of, of those models. Um, there's also a, a, a slightly more practical, it's hard to say entirely practical in philosophy, um, a slightly more practical approach to, to thinking about this. And this has to do with, with what we've just heard from Shannon, the, the kind of tension and, and conflict that's built up and the fact that there are large numbers of people in our communities and in, in our societies and around the world who are not ready to accept um, the conclusive evidence that we have that climate change is actually happening and that our emissions, CO2 in particular, are the cause. And uh, that, that's a real challenging thing. And I've often worked on related issues where I'm, I'm interested in rational belief and what it is that you need to do, how you can try to successfully persuade people to change their minds when they, they have a kind of ide fix. A long time ago, I studied um, um, evolution denial or creationism as it was then caused, called, I should say. Um, as it was then called. And my fellow graduate students told me I was wasting my time because, you know, if you're going to be a philosopher of science, you should look at real science. You shouldn't be interested in that. And I said, you know, I actually thought it was kind of dangerous and I wanted to understand the kind of thinking that was involved and, and find ways to answer it. And we're facing uh, the same kind of thing, I think, uh, on a much larger and a much more threatening scale with climate change. Thank you, Bryson. So maybe following up on that idea of modeling where um, models sometimes as you go further and further out the, the variables are, are greater. So, so kind of building on that, um, what are the major misconceptions when you're communicating climate change? So um, maybe Hester, I'll start with you and then we'll go around and see what other panelists say. So what do you think are the major misconceptions um, of communicating climate change? Or so there's a lot of them, but I'll, I'll start pointing out two of them. One is that people often think, well, climate change in the past, so therefore we cannot have an influence. And the climate has fluctuated much more in the past than we are actually seeing now over the last 150 years. What I usually say in response, if this is asked like at a party, I'll give, I'll give a kind of fun answer. Like in the past, we had forest fires that were caused by lightning. Now, a lot of people actually throw their cigarettes out of the car or maybe don't actually extinguish their campfires. People can cause these forest fires just as much as the lightning caused it. There's still lightning going on, but we have increased our forest fire frequency so much that now people cause more forest fires than the natural causes. And this is exactly what's happening with climate change too. So that's one of the misconceptions that um, when they're proposing, well, it's all natural climate change, they don't see that scientists actually incorporate all these natural factors as well. And when we incorp incorporate all the natural factors and look at the anthropogenic factors, we can now see that anthropogenic factors are certainly, 100% certain, the main cause of the present climate change. Okay, so that's one. Can I... Yeah, one continue, more? Yeah. <laughs> so the, the other thing that kind of is related to that is a misconception about the scientific consensus. So there is a scientific consensus of scientists that have worked on climate change for years and years and years, 
and I can't find any of my colleagues who are scientific climate experts that will deny that climate change is going on and that it is actually caused by anthropogenic uh, e emissions mostly. Now, the reason why the public thinks that there is no scientific consensus is that both the mass media have given just as much voice to the climate change deniers as the climate scientists. And very often the climate change deniers are not climate scientists. They're economists or they're from, you know, if you are working with geology, you may have studied the climate in the past, but you don't understand the climate science of the present. So if you see as the public these two voices and you think that these two voices are equal, you think that there is a division within the climate science community, but there is not. There is there's complete consensus in the climate um, expert community. Thank you. Rob, do you have a follow-up on that? Um, well, I'll start off by saying that I'm not a climate scientist. Um, so, um, but what I, what I will um, discuss is some of the misconceptions around why, or the misunderstanding of why cows produce methane in the first place. Um, and so from, if you look at it from the perspective of the animal, the methane production is actually a mechanism that is used to ensure that feed digestion and metabolism keeps pushing forward. So it's a, it's a way to get rid of the products of metabolism so that metabolism doesn't get stalled. So one of the issues that we face when we're looking at how can we mitigate methane production in beef cattle is we need to consider if you're inhibiting something that helps the animal digest its feed, is that going to make the animal less efficient? And if you're making it less efficient, then um, you may be decreasing methane emissions, but but you're increasing the amount of food that the animal has to eat to grow. So I think one of the things that is really important is to remember that it's not just, it's not black and white, and that when you're talking about, or you're looking at systems like animals, um, there's so many moving parts that if you change one of them, there's a lot of other things that can happen, and it's really important to look at what are those other changes that are happening and um, if you do something to prevent methane emissions um, is that having unintended consequences um, that might be exacerbating what you were trying to accomplish in the first place thank you thank you really far um, so I have a few points on, on this question. I'm really lucky in my job that I get to surround myself with all these passionate people about climate change. Um, I get to be part of the Energy Futures Lab fellowship. I get to take part in the climate leadership program. And I, I must put myself in a bubble because every time I talk to a member of those groups, we're always like, yes, climate change is happening and it's serious and we should do something, we need to do something. But the minute I step outside of that bubble, I'm met with hostility and just people who are just like, no, climate change isn't happening. And then it always goes back to energy, it always goes back to oil and gas and pipelines. And I'm not sure if many of you know, but one of the major industries in, in Ghana is oil. It's oil and gas. So even speaking about climate change on my own reserve, I'm hit with that hostility. We have our people, we have our stewards of the land who are saying there is environmental degradation going on and it's serious and it's happening and it's going to threaten our future, it's going to threaten our ceremonies, it's going to threaten our traditions but stay away from oil and gas. Don't touch that topic. And what, from what I'm seeing in, in the general public and in the mass media is that our economy, 
cannot sustain itself without oil and gas. That's just the way it is. But we're not talking about this transition that's currently happening. We met peak oil and gas in 2006. We met that peak demand. Now, oil and gas companies they have to pay so much more for their engineers, for their equipment, to be able to extract more. They're getting it from you know, the heavy bitumen. They're getting it from the Arctic exploration. They're getting it from hydrofracking. So all the money that we're, they're putting into that, they're firing their workers, the little guys. And those little guys still have to put food on their tables. Why aren't we talking about that? And that's one of the major discussions that I continue to have with people who are willing to listen to me. <laughs> so it, it all comes down to our, our, our energy and, and our own perceptions and our own uses and, and my God, is it complex, people. People wanna talk about the past, like Hester mentioned. People wanna talk about the dirty 30s. We had our droughts. You know, there was times where we didn't have water and we made it. Did we have ocean acidification as well during those times? Pretty sure we didn't. So it is a difficult concept to talk about at a party. I don't know what parties you're going to, Hester. <laughs> and, and to friends of mine, you know, I, I always, I, I will, consistently have friends who will argue with me about climate change and about how it's affecting them and how it's not a big deal as big as, as people are saying. And I'm, I'm always conflicted. I'm always very conflicted because I'm hearing from professionals like Bryson, like the Alberta Narratives Project. They, they did their study on communicating climate change and their you know, they came out with Albertans. We can't be alienating people. We can't be black and white. We can't be all or nothing. Albertans and our identity is that we got to come at it from this transitioning, easygoing zone. Everyone's opinion is, is beautiful. Everyone's opinion is respected, and I get it. But then there's this other part of me that's been looking at climate change research, and we have less than two decades to fix it. That's a very, very complicated emotion that goes on daily. So to answer your question, that's one of the misconceptions, is that we have time. Do we have that much time? Thank you. <laughs> Stu. From your perspective. Uh, really pleased to sit in between Deandra and Shannon and, and um, <laughs> very proud as well in that they're, they're both alumni and uh, I think the future looks bright relative to people even though we're kind of messing a few things up relative to climate. So relative to the question um, and misconception, I think one of the greatest challenges is the general public and, and including the scientists as well, recognizes the difference between climate and weather. Climate's what we expect, weather's what we get. February 2019 was probably the second coldest February in, in the history of Alberta relative to the weather record. Doesn't mean that climate warm or global warming's over. That's weather, okay? We had a, a, a cool snap. And of course, if you remember January and December, uh, they were in fact slightly warmer than average, so it's gonna even out. We'll have it probably overall. Anyway, so this business of, of weather and climate is a great challenge, and following from Bryson's comments about modeling, um, we're not very good at, at modeling next week's weather or the weather two weeks from now, but climate is this um, averaged process, it's cluster of processes, and so we are actually better able to understand climate patterns and climate trends. And so what we need to do, and we need to recognize that we're going to have hot weather. Last week it almost hit 20, okay? Um, but again, that's weather. We had a, 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 a warm spell after a prolonged cold spell. Um, this also relates, again, getting back to water, to the challenges, including aspects such as floods. So the flood of uh, 2013 was, uh, at that time, the most expensive disaster in Canadian history through Calgary. 
uh, the flood through Calgary. $5 billion. Um, and uh, right off the bat, people said, oh, that's climate change. Well, no, not really. Uh, what that is is weather, but it's a weather element that is indeed influenced by climate. And so the, the challenge that we face is, are, in fact, floods going to worsen? Um, this is a particular topic that we study. And, and if you look at the data, um, peak flows in southern Alberta rivers over the last century have actually been declining. And the reason they've been declining is probably because with uh, advancement of spring, the snow melt is earlier. And so by the time we get the heavy rains, which is typically the beginning of June, um, there's less contribution from snow melt. Um, we've had very heavy uh, rains and floods in southern Alberta. And one of the, the proudest things about living in Lethbridge is that uh, following the flood of 1953, finally, the municipal leaders of what was first Colbanks and then Lethbridge said, enough, enough, let's move the city out of the valley. And so we're going to have weather events. Let's understand that, that they're superimposed on climate. Some of the weather events will be really challenging, and some of the weather events are ones that we really should stay away from. So trying to tame um, patterns of hydrology won't work, and trying to tame patterns of hydrology that's superimposed in climate change will certainly not work. We need to leave room for the river, um, and so uh, we need to anticipate that there are going to be weather events in the future, um, but some might be worsened. I don't know that, that floods necessarily regionally are increasing, but they probably are increasing other places. Hurricanes, typhoons, there's other sorts of things. We need to understand more about the interaction between climate and weather, but we should remind our neighbors and friends that if we have a warm day or a cool day, it doesn't mean the climate's changing. Thank you, Sue. Shannon. Thank you for asking this question because I've been carrying around this pet peeve recently, and this is the perfect opportunity to, to bring it out. Um, so what I've been seeing recently in the newspapers and, and different places, social media, is this um, marginalization of environmental issues and climate change in particular as a special interest. And it's driving me crazy. Um, and I actually think it's very insulting to those of us that work in the environmental sector. Um, you know, it's, it's obviously everybody needs clean water, everybody needs clean air. And to say that, that it's a special interest and we're all just um, rolling in cash from rich Americans who are like, using us for their own agenda and, um, you know, there, I think part of the, the larger problem is the what we saw, I think it was actually two years ago now, the global implosion of trust and um, what was a big headline for a while. And I, I still am feeling that from our, um, you know, on the front lines from folks in the community is there's, there's very little trust of government, um, of, of scientists and um, those who work even in the nonprofit sector. There's um, this you know, notion that, that we're in it for ourselves and we're getting rich and we're um, you know, corrupt and, and just willing to say any old thing for money and that you know, science is totally biased and science is a joke and that sort of thing. And, and um, it's really sad and it's really insulting and I think that's one of the big mis misconceptions that um, is very difficult to deal with and it has to get back to that issue of trust and how do we build trust and um, build personal relationships with people so that they will um, speak to us about these difficult issues because the messenger matters very, very much and if there is no trust then um, you know, we're not going to get anywhere. So it has to come down to those, those personal relationships and, and meaningful experiences that we can have with people um, to get over this, this very real barrier. Thank you. Bryson. I just want to say that that's a really important issue. The communications issue here has been extremely challenging uh, for a long time now, and it doesn't seem to be getting a lot better. And it's very disappointing to see uh, the behavior of the Republican Party in the United States and the behavior of some uh, so-called conservatives. I don't think it really fits the definition of the word conservative uh, to, to just 
fly in the face of, of what science is telling us and telling us very clearly. Um, Stu stole the first thing I was going to say on these lines because uh, I was going to talk about the difference between weather and climate and the fact that climate is basically a, a sort of statistical study of weather patterns. Um, and one thing that's worth adding perhaps is that if you think of a normal distribution, um, you get some very rare events out at both ends of a normal distribution. If you shift that in one direction or another, a little warmer, a little wetter, a little drier, right? the number of extreme events can go up quite rapidly. And, and that's a, a real risk when it comes to climate change. The mean temperature doesn't have to go up a lot to cause much more extreme hot weather, which actually causes problems for people in, in cities when they can't stay cool enough, as in Europe. I think, I forget the year in the 2000s when quite a number of people died in Europe over, during a heat wave. Um, but what else? Um, it's, it's actually fairly easy to understand how CO2 warms the Earth's climate. This is not, this is not something that comes just from climate models, as I mentioned, that I mentioned earlier. Um, this, this is something that, that goes back, first of all, to uh, the early 19th century, when Joseph Fourier, Fourier was working on thermodynamics, and he was able to show that, that the, the energy, the heat in the light coming down from the sun to the ground surface um, was not matched by the radiant energy escaping up. The radiant energy escaping up from the surface of the Earth if it were just going off into space, would tell you that the Earth would be much cooler than it actually is on average. And so he realized there had to be something going on in the atmosphere that was trapping some of that, as he called it, uh, non-luminous heat. Today we call it infrared radiation. Um, so that's Fourier. And then subsequently figures like Tyndall and Foote and in the late 19th century Arrhenius developed measures, well, first of all, they identified CO2 as a gas, and uh, Tyndall showed that it absorbed the, um, the newly discovered infrared radiation, which Fourier had called, as I said, um, just, just um, non-luminous uh, heat. Um, so we're talking about 19th century science, and Arrhenius actually calculated that the emission of carbon due to coal burning at the time was the main focus for that. Uh, would actually warm the Earth's climate. So th this is not something radical and new. We need good models now to, to actually anticipate and measure and, and get good numbers for, for what we ought to expect or what we can reasonably expect to happen on different scenarios. But, but it's not new science and it's not all based on fancy computer models. It's very, very basic. Thank you, Bryson. I'm going to follow up with a couple questions. I'm going to start with the scientists first. Um, as a science communicator, how do you effectively communicate climate change? Who would start us on that one? Anyone want to tackle it? I can. Okay, go ahead, Shannon. Um, so that's kind of our bag at the OWC is how do we communicate um, science to the public and to people. So I'm happy to tackle that. Um, basically, it's, it's about trust, as I mentioned, um, and, and respect, of course. But I think the key is how do we make it personally relevant and meaningful to the individual. Um, we can't... Um, we know that facts don't lead to action. Knowledge and, and um, science, unfortunately, isn't enough. We have to connect people um, personally and directly to something that they care about and um, in ways that they can actually experience something. Um, it's not enough to know something mentally. Um, our human nature is that we actually need to experience it as a you know, as a, a, a thing that happens to us. It's, um, and um, so what we need to do is, is things like um, taking people outside. Yay, imagine that. Um, and, and having personal, meaningful conversations with our friends and family. You know, it's, sometimes that's really hard, but those are the people that trust you. Those are the people that care about you and that will listen to you. And it might be easier to talk to strangers, but the stranger doesn't care what you have to say. Um, so it's, it's definitely about um, kind of mobilizing 
people to talk to their friends and family and getting people to have meaningful experiences in nature, preferably. And um, um, just being really um, empathetic and respectful and that um, um, not accusatory is very important. We, we don't want to point fingers and, um, you know, pe people are very emotional. We all have our day-to-day -day problems to deal with and um, things we, we need to work on and we all have egos and you have to remember that and really be realistic that it's hard and it's not um, going to happen right away and that it takes time and effort. Um, to really change people's minds. Um, one, one study um, that Cows and Fish did, who works with landowners and changing their behavior on land management, is that it takes often seven years to change someone's uh, mind enough that it will actually lead to action and not just you know increase knowledge, increase belief, or better attitude, but actual action. Um, and that's just at an individual level. We could you know, scale that up to think about politicians in the same way. You know, they're just people too, and it's not, um, we can't just rely on individual action. We have to see, you know, larger um, government effort um, supported by, by the votes. Thank you, Shannon. Stu. Uh, I'd like to follow from uh, Shannon's emphasis on experience and exposure and, and getting outdoors. Lethbridge is relatively unique globally in that from the city of Lethbridge, we can see a glacier. If you drive south on Wuvuk Drive and you go to Cottonwood Park and you overlook and you look to the south and west, you'll see uh, Glacier National Park, Montana. And if you have good eyes or, or binoculars, you can actually see Old Sofa Glacier. And um, so what I'd suggest is what, if, if you have doubters, if people who are unconvinced, um, go on a trip. It's an hour and a half to get to many glaciers in Montana. You've got to get across the border, so you need a visa or a passport these days. But anyway, go to Cardston, keep on going. Um, in many glaciers, uh, a splendid two-hour hike up to Grinnell Glacier. And there is a really interesting and impressive sequence of photographs. You can get these po posted on the web um, because the USGS group in Glacier National Park have been tracking the glaciers since about 1850. And so you can, go, you can go today and you can see, and you can see the moraines where the glacier toe would have previously been, but you can also take a look at air photos and surface or land um, level photos of what the glacier looked like 10 years, 20 years, 30 years ago. And, and Grinnell's dropped about a half um, of its uh, area in the last half century, and it's likely to, in about two decades from now it might be gone, so you have to go soon. But anyway, um, go and take a look and take your friends who are doubters, and then again show them the, the picture that, that relating to the processes that Hester talks about. Um, so we, we live in an area where climate change is pretty observable, and, and, um, and finally relative to that, it's suggested that the glaciers in Glacier National Park will be gone in, in two to three, um, um, decades, and so the name will have to be changed. Bryson? Um, one thing that you can do is ask them to explain, you know, what is it they're denying? Uh, why do they want to deny that? Where are they hearing this, this, this misleading uh, claim if they're citing a source? And, and, and just, just keep pursuing it. it. It's important to be gentle. Uh, it's important not to be confrontational. But most of the people who are denying climate change are people who have very little technical understanding of, of what is causing climate change, why it happens, what makes the climate work anyway. Uh, and so their, their positions are tied, as, as we've already heard, to their work and their sense of how our society functions and their, their sense that, that there's uh, something threatening in the idea of doing something about climate change because it involves changes, and this is another thing that's worth emphasizing, uh, that because it involves changes in the way that they now live and the way that we in general as a society live and function and make a living. Um, and it's important there to realize how short a time we've been doing anything like the things that we now take for granted, whether it's transporting goods and cars and trucks and aircraft and massive ships around the world, or, or producing um, 
megatons of, of automobiles and other major energy consuming products. And, and it, it's, it's a civilization that's built up uh, very, very rapidly. A huge amount of the total CO2 that we've emitted was, has emitted, been emitted in the last 20 or 30 years, I think on the order of 50% of what's ever been emitted by humans burning fossil fuels. Uh, I think is only in the last 30 years, and I, I may be a little off with that figure, but it's in that neighborhood. So what, we've been, what we're now doing is something absolutely unprecedented. We're raising CO2 levels in particular at a rate that you don't see in the geological record. And, and if we can get people to understand just how big an impact we really are having as a civilization, it becomes more plausible to say, look, you know, that's, that's having effects. And, and we actually do understand that these effects are already well underway. Thank you, Bryson. Um, another question. As someone working in the community affected by climate change, what do you consider effective communication for your needs? Anyone want to do that from the community? I just want to jump back to the last uh, okay. question. You're up. All right. Um, <laughs> Uh, one of the points that I wanted to make, I thought there was a lot of really good points there, but uh, for me, when I'm talking to uh, people about the type of science that I do, I think one of the, the really important things is to break down the barriers of the terminology that's used. I think learning, working in science, every science has its own terminology, and so as a microbiologist, I have a specific language and we use a lot of words that make sense to other microbiologists but not to most other people and similarly a physicist or um, you know an, an ecologist we all have terms that we know but it's important that we can translate that and um, so that the general public um, can understand what it is we're doing and what we mean when we're saying these things that nobody else says. Thank you for that. So on to our final question before we open it to our audience. But if you are a community member working um, or feeling the effects of climate change, how do you, what kind of things do you need uh, from scientists, let's say, to help you better communicate to the public that you're dealing with? Yes, please go ahead. This is a little awkward, so I'm actually also going to jump back. To All the right, last, last question about about the the you know communicating it to to the community, um, and I know that that Shannon kind of touched on this, but what I've what I found in the community and in general public is there's a lot of denial based on fear, that fear of the unknown, that fear of this uncertain future. And there's a lot of climate dialogue that people will say is fear-mongering. We talk about the floods, we talk about the wildfires, we talk about there's going to be a future that will probably include more of that. And that's what turns people off. People are going to shut down. And I, I get it. Sometimes I just want to shut down. So when I'm talking to community members about climate change, about the important work, and this is something that, that's been touched on by, um, by other experts who, who've studied communicating climate change, that climate change is a big deal, but it's not the biggest deal to, to individuals. Individuals, you know, like, like on our First Nation, on my First Nation, one of the biggest things happening right now is the fentanyl crisis. It's addictions, it's substance abuse. How are people in this level really supposed to understand the bigger picture of climate change? And yet one of the biggest, well, one of the first, sorry, one of the first reports that I read when I got my job was that climate change is actually going to increase nighttime activity. So we get hotter days, 
So more people are going to be resting during the day and they're going to come out at nighttime and that's going to actually increase a lot of the nighttime activity going on. So there's that social aspect to it. Suddenly, I mention that to people and they're like, oh yeah, that's, that makes sense. That is going to happen. All right, all right, how, how, how are we going to deal with that now? How are we going to adapt to that kind of future? What kind of adaptation infrastructure are we going to put to support a successful community? Yeah. Thank you. Hester, did you have something to say? So, uh, yeah, I, just like the rest, I'm ignoring the moderator and going back to that yeah, previous right. question. <laughs> That's fair enough. <laughs> and, uh, and, but it kind of nicely ties into some of the answers because the, the question was, maybe I should repeat it, what if, is effective communication? And people have been saying, well, scientists haven't really been good at it. Well, we've been very good at communicating the science and the information and the data, but perhaps not so good at some other things. But what I want to point now it is often when you ask a climate scientist if they're fearful for the future, they're often not the most negative people. We're actually quite optimistic. And this comes from one um, thing that I want to teach mostly my students too, is if you take somebody up to the Grinnell Glacier, what um, uh, Stu just said, if I'm looking at the glacier, I look up with di different eyes to the glacier than somebody that I take up. And I look at it with eyes that have learned to see the nature in four dimensions. And the, f the fourth dimension is deep geological time. Whereas the people that I'm showing it to, most people that haven't had like a geoscience or like a climate science background, think about time in much shorter perspective and about uh, processes in much shorter perspective. And also in terms of our role, in either a much bigger or a smaller perspective. We as people are both the worst for like the, the climate that we're changing right now, but also, we're also one of the most vulnerable people because we have lungs and we need to breathe and we are not as adaptable as your cockroaches that will actually survive you. <laughs> so what I'm thinking is as effective climate change is also like opening the perspective to people so that they see what you're seeing and each of us will see something different with a different paradigm. If you can communicate across these paradigms and, and show that you can view time as like a different kind of deeper time, you can view your role as either big or small in this perspective or that perspective, then you both touch on people's individual experiences and their fear and they understand why climate scientists are perhaps not so fearful. Thank you. We're now going to turn to the audience. So there are mics available. So if you want to ask a question, please go up to the mic. And to start us off, I have a written question that was um, submitted. Do melting ice sheets in Greece, Greenland and Antarctica have enough of a cooling effect on the oceans to partially mask the effects of climate change, at least temporarily? Hester, why don't you take us with that? Well, that question is really about glo the difference between global climate change and regional effects. So the Greenland ice sheet, the waters of the Greenland ice sheet are going into the North Atlantic. And we've had over the past hundreds of years and thousands of years, cooler periods and warmer periods. And most of these cooler periods were more like uh, palpable and measurable in the northern hemisphere because we're actually more influenced by, for example, the Gulf Stream and we have more land mass in the northern hemisphere. So these melting ice sheets, both melting ice sheets, will disrupt ocean currents, but these ocean currents are more important for some parts of the world than for other parts. So they do have a considerable effect in, for example, France, where you can now grow wine, we're at the same latitude as Lethbridge, um, and they grow wine, but they won't be able to grow wine. You won't be able to buy the French wine <laughs> if that Gulf Stream is actually affected. But it may not be having as much of an effect in Lethbridge or in the Andes in South America. So yes, these ice sheets have a considerable effect, but these effects are often regional and still globally the climate will get warmer overall.
So does that mean in the future we might be able to grow wine in Lethbridge? <laughs> Uh, not unless the, the Rocky Mountains completely crumble down. <laughs> Kent. Thank you. Uh, really interesting discussion. And I'll, I'll tell a story and turn it into a question. So in, in uh, May 1940, Winston Churchill took over as Prime Minister of Great Britain. And I think it was his first speech to the House of Commons. He said, look, uh, we're in a war. It's going to be really, really bad. We're going to try and win it, but I have nothing to promise you but blood, sweat, toil, and tears. And I don't know if you're going to come out on the other side. That's the way it's going to be. And I think that his, uh, one of his great aspects of his leadership at that point was his ability to tell the unvarnished truth. It wasn't very nice, but he said, look, we're in a war. I don't know if we're going to win. A lot of people are going to get hurt. It's going to be really, really bad. Now, similarly, I would say similar things about the climate crisis right now. And in particular, you know, we are in a situation that is, many scientists would say, is, is dire. And certainly one of the outcomes from it is that the world has to get off oil and gas, has to, pretty soon. And that there is no long-term future for fossil fuels in Alberta. And that's going to be a really hard thing to say to people. A lot of people don't want to hear that. So, let, let, so, so my point is, sometimes you have to tell the unvarnished truth even though people don't want to hear it. Now I know that as a communicator, maybe that's not always the best thing to do, but maybe I'll just turn this back to, to any member of the panel that wishes to respond. How do you balance the need for simply doing what Churchill did in May 1940 and telling the truth with the need to not just overwhelm people to help people to cope with the situation. Well, another need in that neighborhood is the need to get elected. And, and that's a particular challenge here in Alberta today, I suppose. Um, but I agree completely. I mean, uh, the, the, the final measure that we, we take of our effectiveness at communicating about climate has to be a really substantial change in the economy. We have to have changes in the basic sources of energy we rely on. We have to have changes in their applications in the economy. And we have to have changes, that is, in particular, in transportation, in manufacturing, in farming, in construction. We, we should have been raising our building standards years ago. Um, my father went to work uh, in the mid-1970s for the Institute of Man and Resources in Prince Edward Island as their chief engineer. And that was during a time when uh, oil exports from uh, the Middle East were being constrained, and there was a lot of concern about energy supplies. There was investment in Canada, heavy investment in wind energy research, and, and this is the kind of stuff that my father was doing at the time. And when oil came back onto the market, um, governments decided to just subsidize oil exploration and continue producing more and more oil um, and keep running the economy in the same old way. And we, we missed a chance, I think, there to actually make a, a, a creditable trans, transition. It was already clear, by the way, to climate scientists that these changes were on the way. We didn't have the sophisticated models that we now have, but it was already clear that our CO2 emissions were making a difference and were going to make a larger difference soon. Um, so it, it, it is a big fight, Kent. Um, and, and it will be a very difficult challenge in communication when it comes, especially here and now, to getting elected, um, where certain people who call themselves conservatives are proclaiming that, that the, the carbon tax has to be killed and, and that, that it's really just a tax grab, even though there's a rebate involved that gives most of the money directly back to individual Canadians. It's hard to see how that works out as a tax grab. The Liberals have got to get their, their ducks in a row if they really want a tax grab. But at any rate, um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Anyone else? Shannon. Yeah, um, I think that is a great strategy and the perfect message for a group of um, like keeners who are working on the climate crisis. The people who want to work on the issue, who are um, you know already on board with it and are um, moving ahead. You know, those are the messages that will rally them and keep them going. And that's an important thing that we need to do is keep those people doing what they're doing. Um, but for other folks who, who are just going to shut down and, and who have the fears and, and all that, uh, that's, that's not going to work. So you have to really kind of um, 
we, we have to get over our own selves and our own beliefs and really just focus on what's effective. And the first rule of communications is listening. Listening is the, is the tool that the community members need to solve these problems. Um, getting back to your question a while ago. Um, that, that's the skill that, that we need to teach community members and um, be, it's because listening, for one, builds trust and acknowledges fears and worries and pressing concerns and, and says, that's okay, we get it. I'm here, I'm listening, I got it. And then it also, um, it helps you to learn about your, your audience or whoever it is that you're speaking to, if, whether it's one person or a group, you have to know your audience. That's the second golden rule of communications. Um, you know, it, it, there's no point in saying uh, something um, that might be really brutally, honestly true if it's not going to work. It has to be effective. So um, that'd be that'd be my advice. Stu, you had a comment. Uh, uh, sure, for a strange cluster of intersections, Kent um, Winston Churchill um, reminded me of the person in Alberta who I think is exemplary in terms of. Um, communicating elements of climate change and water. He's been described as the Winston Churchill of water. His name is Bob Sanford. He was the head of the UN Decade of Water. He's a global citizen. Um, his books are brilliant, but his um, seminars are even more so. So um, if you ever get a chance, um, it's highly worthwhile and uh, listening to him. And in the meantime, um, pick up his books. Bob Sanford. Thank you. Our next uh, question. It's not a question, but the uh, plea. Let us have 17 First Nations settlements, village, towns, whatever you call, have clean drinking water now yes. in 2019. Yes. Yes. Justin T said. In six years, no, we, we pledged, or as taxpayers, we, Justin T, pledged $20 million to Venezuela. Fine, let's pledge whatever it takes to our First Nations, and I have more to say, but uh, I'll shut up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I... <laughs> the next question. Sorry, wait, can I, can oh, please I do. Uh, yeah. respond to that? I want to I want to thank you for bringing that up and and there is like some some element there's environmental issues um, r related to that that um, Shannon mentioned earlier in the fact that water somehow is a special interest to can to you know separate from everyone else um, and yet yet it affects everyone and why are indigenous peoples so disproportionately affected. Going back to a case study in Quebec for one of their dams, you know, the indigenous people said, no, don't put this dam there, don't put this dam there. That's where we hunt, that's where we fish. But of course, Quebec, the people, the, the whole general public were like, no, we need hydro dams, we need hydro dams. So they flooded this area, which brought up mercury from under the ground, and it poisoned their fish. And those are the fish that the people are eating. So now there's mercury in the kids, there's mercury in the community. And that's just an example of what these irresponsible policies can affect when you don't listen to the indigenous people. And I appreciate being brought to the table tonight and I really hope this continues into the future in every table that we're all sitting at. Include Indigenous people, respect their voices, listen to them, because it's going to affect you. It's going to affect all Canadians, all Albertans, all Lethbridgians. It's affecting us. So thank you. Next question. 
Hi. Uh, thanks for the wonderful talk and the great discussion. Gra glad that it's being addressed by uh, everybody and being brought further to uh, public attention. With all the avenues that scientists and people are trying to come at for solving global warming and any kind of climate change, what's plan B if that fails? Is there an option that we could take if, say, in the next 20 years, we can't solve this problem? What would be a backup plan to being able to continue human civilization? Go ahead, Esther. Well, the bad news is there's no plan B. I mean, the, the bad news is if we don't do anything, then in the next, by 2100, we will have a four degrees um, global climate increase. There are a lot of studies um, that look at how do we adapt to that. So there are strategies in place, and there's already some countries in, for example, the Southern Pacific Ocean that have agreements with um, Australia and New Zealand that they can actually be climate refugees and don't then have to apply for citizenship in Australia or New Zealand. So there are already these kind of forward-looking um, things in place in terms of adapting to that. But there's no, like, unless we actually do something now, there's no plan B, like, if we don't do anything for 20 years, this is what we can do. We have to do it now. Okay. Well, Stu, you, you want an additional comment? Uh, sure. Hester mentioned uh, adaptation. Um, I, I do think uh, while there might not be a full plan B, there are certainly lots of things that people are thinking of. And, um, uh, there, this relates to urban planning, um, uh, trying to reduce uh, occupation of floodplain zones, flood-prone zones, um, strengthening uh, zoning regulations. Um, I'm interested in, in forest biology. Something is called assisted migration, whereby um, uh, instead of planting the same types of, uh, the same genotypes of trees, with the reforestation pro um, project, what you will try to do is, is anticipate um, the warming and the influence. So what might happen then is instead of planting um, lodgepole pine from Alberta, you might uh, plant lodgepole pine from Montana. Um, so there are some things that are being done. Um, and I think some are somewhat promising, um, but some are desperate. And, and it is a serious challenge. And as with health, um, prevention is better than treatment. Bryson, do you want to follow up? Yeah. There, there certainly are things we can do to mitigate, as Stu is saying. But I think it's also important to realize that it is within our grasp to, to do this. And I think in, in many ways, we can say we should be more confident than Churchill was about winning World War II. Because uh, the, the rate at which uh, the cost of uh, solar energy, the cost of wind energy is declining is, is really still continuing to be quite astounding. Uh, we're already getting, you know, bids on wind energy in Texas that beat existing coal plants. So you, you can build a whole new windmill and supply electricity with that windmill for less than it costs to keep running a coal plant. And, and that's, that's a fact that's emerging, you know, as the economics shift in other regions as well. And um, in other respects, I mean, on a more personal level, um, it's already that the cost of ownership for electric cars is already lower than the cost of ownership for gasoline or diesel powered cars for internal combustion. An internal combustion engine and transmissions and so on, these are very complex things. And so although we have to pay so much for the batteries now that the cars as of today cost more up front than, than comparable vehicles powered by gas or diesel, um, the, the total cost of ownership, because maintenance on an electric engine, maintenance on a transmission that only requires two speeds, uh, maintenance on, on uh, other aspects of these cars, maintenance on brakes is reduced because they use electromagnetic braking, which doesn't wear your pads or your rotors. So um, we have the technological skill and capacity to install an energy system that will sustain a high quality of life and, and power the vehicles that we need to transport goods. Um, and, and if we start investing in that and shifting out of oil and gas, which is a difficult thing to say in Alberta, um, then, then I think it's really clear that we can win this war. Thank you. Our next question. <laughs> 
Uh, it's not so much a question as a frustration, actually. You guys are talking a lot about communication and how to communicate with the public. As one of the public, and probably the largest group that, uh, you know, I, I know what I want to argue, I need the resource. So uh, you have many disciplines in many universities across Canada. I want access to them. I'd like a site, I'd like a place where somebody argues with me, I can say, let's go here. The facts are here. So um, when the other day, because I was just at your talk last week, and I was talking to a person saying it was really interesting. And they said, aha, but there is a, gl a, a glacier growing in such and such a place. And I said, there's more to this, but I can't actually explain what I heard from you, nor from any of you. There is so much science out there that's real, and we are being thrown so much that is not. And it's being used as political ammunition and games, and people get so frustrated because you actually, you need the facts to argue. So I need a resource, and everybody in this country needs that factual resource real science, not pseudoscience, uh, something that we can all go to and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, I know better than this. So it's not really a question, is it? It's saying, I need this, and I think a lot of us do. Hester, and then I think Bryson had his hand too. Hester? So misinformation and propaganda is a real problem because as general public, often you cannot like differentiate between the information that comes from that side and the real data and the information that comes from the real scientists. So there is, there are some websites, for example, realclimate.org. They are, they were initially set up as a blog by scientists and they actually address some of these questions that come up as they come up when misinformation is spread. You can go to these websites and often there's a whole range like, why do people not believe in climate change? And this is, for example, a site that I would direct everybody to. But the other thing is at the University of Lethbridge, like I know that all of my colleagues, if you have specific questions, you can always email us. You can always like uh, make an appointment and like well, we have to partly like communicate with the people outside the universities, outside our own bubble. So everybody is welcome. If you have a particular question about glaciers, just not everybody tomorrow uh, knock on my door. Um, but I'm really happy to actually like talk with you if you have specific questions and give you the direct information and help you make that differentiation yourself between the misinformation and the real information. Okay, I, I think maybe I'm, I need to maybe make this a little clearer. The population out there needs a single source that we know. We can say go to I'm a scientist, the rest of you go jump in the lake. We need a source. We can't go looking for sources because you are actually in a bubble and then you have another bubble and another bubble. But the vast majority of the population out there simply needs an address that probably is Canadian and um, is scientific and can then be explained. There's a lot of disciplines here. It can be made easy we need to find this. If you want to communicate to us, supply us with a single place, get together, get along, get all those things in one place so we can find it. Because if, it, if you wanted tomorrow, hey, try to look up home sharing because uh, I'm, I'm part of a, a nonprofit. Try to find a single site for that. Go see if you can find it. We need a single place. With all the universities and all of the studies and all of the science together, I gotta say a website is really cheap and really easy in this world. You can supply us one single thing that we all know and then we actually can fight this thing and stand up and kick a couple politicians in the butt because we're all tired of the lies. That, make it clear, just one site, one name, give it to us, we need it. I, I have Thank one, you. I do have one to suggest. Um, realclimate.org is very good, um, but it's a little bit 
technical, and you'd have to search through the debates to see what points are being addressed from, from week to week. Uh, there's another site that's designed explicitly to answer these kinds of questions. It's called skepticalscience.com. It's developed at the University of Western Australia uh, by John Cook and Stephen Lewandowski. Uh, Lewandowski's at Bristol now. And uh, they have three levels of answers for all of the questions. When you look for answers to your questions, you can get a straightforward, simple, direct answer, and you can get as far in as you want. And they also have links to relevant articles. Uh, and they have uh, answers to basic climate myths as well. So uh, I, I recommend it very highly. Skeptical science, all one word, dot com. All right, question here. Let's try to keep our questions a little short so we can move on. Okay, is this one on? Yeah. Okay, I have a cow question. Um, so I know a little bit about um, how methane is like, I've heard different numbers, but it's supposed to be something like eight to 16 times more effective at retaining heat than carbon dioxide, but it's proportionately, there's less of it in the atmosphere than carbon dioxide. And so I do know that cows produce a lot of it. So how big of a deal is cattle methane emissions in the world in the contribution to climate change? Uh, that's a good question. So if we look at um, numbers in Canada, that's what I can speak to. Numbers in Canada, agricultural contributions to greenhouse gas emissions are estimated to be about 20% of total greenhouse gas emissions. Of that 20%, approximately six to six and a half percent can be attributed to enteric methane production. So um, methane production from cattle, um, other types of ruminants. So 6% um, of, ca of Canada's emissions. Um, and I think that yeah, I'll, I'll stay there. It's, it's about 6%. So. Thank you. Question? We may have to speak up because we're competing next door, it seems. Okay. Um, is there future plans or current ways to communicate climate change to youth? Who would like to pick that one up? Communicating to youth. Anything? I'm, I'm pretty sure there are some... some some people working on that at the, I, I'm pretty sure there are some people working on that at the textbook level. Um, I, I certainly know that some teachers are concerned about it and, and, I, and it's, I'm not sure where it is in the Alberta curriculum, but it is in other curricula, Stu, do you? Uh, I'm somewhat familiar with the current textbooks for biology, chemistry, and physics 30, and it's basically absent to the best of my knowledge. And so it, it is a deficiency. Um, we should correct it. Alberta especially should correct it. So, yeah. so there, there are um, quite a few different programs available depending on where you live. Like there's a lot more in Calgary and Edmonton. Um, there's not as many in Lethbridge um, and Southwest Alberta. Um, but like for example, in Calgary and Edmonton, there's groups like Inside Education. They basically, all they do is field trips and classroom presentations and things like that. And there's lots of groups like that, like um, Science in Schools is another example, uh, River Watch. Um, take kids out on, on the rivers floating and learning about stuff and um, like even OWC we, we do some classroom presentations and things um, so it's it's kind of spread out I would say over a bunch of different groups and primarily nonprofits who are doing that. Can you pinpoint one from like the youngest age like um, I'm currently 15 so would you pinpoint like that lower maybe to like 10 do you know any lower education for climate change? Um, I don't know the exact grades that they target, but I think a lot of them are K to 12. Like there, there is stuff, um, and I, I could find some and, and send that to you if you want. You can chat after. Question? Question? 
Uh, I've really enjoyed some of the input, and I particularly liked how some of you suggested that there is hope and there are options. And I think from a, so I spent my life being in advertising and marketing, so I'm a communicator. And since I moved to Alberta 10 years ago, I've ended up marketing tourism in Southwest Alberta. And lately, working with the Swell organization out of uh, Pincher Creek, we're in the process of putting together a, a tour of the energy future of Southern Alberta. And I think one of the things that we as Albertans don't appreciate enough is just how innovative and how many other kinds of energy we're busy producing an industrial scale at this point in time. So we want to actually take people out and give them the experience that some of you suggested. So I'm going to be interested to talk to you directly. But um, I think that that's one of the things that you can do. And, and the Swell Group in Pincher is working with school age kids and created it as a school program. And then the school district in Calgary wanted them to give it over and volunteer their time to do it for all their kids so they didn't have to pay any money for it. So there, there are challenges to that. But I actually think that people from around the world, when they come here, the landscape of Alberta is, it amazes them. And we have a lot going on here that's very, very positive. So let's show that to the world. And I'm just curious, any of you think that's a good idea? I think they're all saying yes, so. <laughs> Next question. Thank you. Uh, okay, I kind of have a two-parter, I guess. Um, and to preface it by saying that I've seen the writing on the wall, I have divested myself of, uh, or trying to divest myself from the oil and gas kind of milieu. I've been generating my own power for 15 years now. I live in a straw bale house that I built myself, uh, trying to keep my carbon footprint as low as possible. However, I have a question. I haven't heard anything about economics. Um, whether or not the capitalist system is the driver of this, um, and as well our crumbling infrastructure um, in terms of, say, the electrical grid, which is 100 years old and powered by or controlled by electromagnet electromechanical switches, um, as well as, like, say, some of the internet stuff that's all along the coast that could be inundated by sea level rise stop the flow of easy flow of information around the world um, and I guess it's not really that it's just like I say I've been doing this and I hear you know hope and yeah we're gonna beat this thing yet in 15 years we have had no help from the business world um, I've done all of this kind of on my own, there's no government assistance. Uh, you know, one just a kind of an aside is that there's a solar panel rebate for Albertans, except if you live on reserve, then it's you don't get anything because it's all just for the band. Uh, but anyways, that's an aside. Uh, what do you see the role of economics in the coming climate crisis doing? Like. Um, you know, do we have to switch from capitalism to a different type of economy? Perhaps a sharing economy? I don't know. Um, and then what about the actual crumbling infrastructure that we have? Uh, do you think decentralized energy might be the way to go? Uh, Anyone want to pick up that question? I think this is an excellent question for the candidates panel next week. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because one of the things, in, like in my opinion, I'm a scientist, I don't really know much about economy apart from what I know by myself, so I'm not going <laughs> to give advice there. The only advice I, I can give is like, I really applaud you to do this, um, to make a switch without actually economic incentive, but we have a lot of research that economic incentives for rebates, for um, uh, getting tax credits and things like that help in general. And this is also part of, for example, nobody here has talked yet about the Paris Agreement, but uh, when I was so negative about like there's no plan B, we know that we can actually keep our global uh, temperature increase 
within two degrees if we keep to the Paris Agreement, which was actually signed by most people in the world. So we know it's doable, but it's only doable if we have also, for some people, they need economic incentives. So, so can I answer that question? Mm -hmm. Dirk? Yep, go ahead. Thank you, the gentleman, for the question. Um, and I do, it's a great question, sir. I wrote an article, my name is Jim Byrne. I teach a class, senior class called Climate Science and Solutions on the university campus. Um, and I wrote an article in January of 2014 called High Stakes Climate Poker. Just remember High Stakes Climate paper, Poker, go home and Google that and read it. The article's dated. I worked out that right now, keeping fossil fuels costs us six to seven times more than transitioning to renewable energy. And in the end of that article, I said this doesn't include health care. Since that time, the World Health Organization and many other health organizations have said the cost of health care related or air pollution related health, health care treatment disease deaths may be the biggest single thing that we, the biggest single cost in terms of lives and economy. So keeping fossil fuels costs us 10 to 12 times what getting off fossil fuels will cost us. Fossil fuels are a massive subsidy to the rich, and we need to fix that as soon as possible. Thank you, Jim. High stakes climate poker. Just think about Texas Hold'em, and they, they call it high stakes climate poker, so that was the, the trope. Next question. And they said climate scientists weren't in it for the money. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you to the panel. This has been very informative. Uh, here I am with the Paris climate uh, question. Uh, given the failure of the Kyoto Accord in uh, 1997 and the finger pointing that ultimately killed it, it appears as though we're well on our way to the same fate for the Paris Climate Accord. And so, uh, in light of shaping public policy, and I'll just throw this up to anybody in the panel who'd like to catch this ball, uh, how do we counter the very effective argument, whether we agree with it or not, it's certainly effective, that if China and the United States and you know who in the United States and India aren't doing their part to lower emissions effectively, then why on earth are we paying a carbon tax in Alberta? Why on earth are we hurting our oil and gas industry when the rest of the world isn't? Can I answer this one? Yeah, go Please. ahead. Yes. Please. Well, I don't know if I can really answer it, but I'll, I'll respond yeah. to it. So um, I was shown recently a graph that, um, yes, China, India, states, they all have very high emissions, but per capita, Canadians have higher emissions. We're spending all our energy. so. If they're working on their energy systems and if they're working on their energy greed and it comes down, suddenly we're going to be the highest. Suddenly they're going to be pointing their fingers at us. They're not going to want to do business with us. So in that sense, we have that opportunity. We have that capacity to change. We have that capacity to lead that change, to say per capita, per person, we can bring down our own personal energy greed and lead that way for them. Their energy is higher because they have the higher population and this will then go back to what Hester brought up with climate change refugees. Suddenly they're going to have higher populations, they're going to have more environmental degradation, they're going to be coming to us. And they're going to be saying, oh we can spend so much energy, suddenly they're spending all of Canada's energy, our energy is going to get higher. So that's why we need to, as Canadians, as Albertans, to look at our own energy greed. It's not so much, again, that's not pointing fingers, that you're saying, why are we, you know, that's, that's what's going to cause us failure. We have that opportunity to lead. We're just not taking it. We're being lazy about it. That's my rebuttal. I'd like to add a couple things. Um, Lean in for it, First of all, there's also the history. We've been burning fossil fuels for a lot longer than other countries. Um, the developed Western countries, Canada, the US, Europe, have been burning coal and gas and oil for a very long time. And uh, so if you look at the historical emissions, our contribution to climate change is not only continuing to be disproportionate relative to our population, it's hugely disproportionate historically. And, and so, you know, if, if we're talking about fair dealing, it, it's, it's 
us that really do have to go first. So we're going to have about five minutes left, so we'll, I think we've got about three questions, so go ahead. Okay, successive Alberta governments have emphasized the need to diversify the economy. Um, and as oil and gas takes hopefully a lower profile, what is the prognosis in terms of, I mean, here in southern Alberta we have agriculture, but what is the prognosis over a time frame of 20 to 50 years in terms of our water resources? I mean, will we have enough water, in fact, to, for agriculture to take over from the revenue that's coming in from oil and gas currently? We're going to have less water, yes. You mentioned, Stu, I think your name is, reservoirs in your opening remarks. What is going on in terms of the planning to actually cope with the situation, if you're aware of it? Stu, could you answer that? Yeah, I can, I can reply a little bit. So the province of Alberta did something that was both surprising and visionary in the year 2000. Um, they reviewed the water allocation situation and, and found that the demand was exceeding the supply and they established a moratorium on further licenses. Um, that was at a time when no one thought this would be possible politically, the province did it. Um, at the same time that they, they basically said, okay, we're not going to allow any more water withdrawals from the rivers in the South Saskatchewan system. At the same time they, they, they put a moratorium on, they established a license transfer system. And so what that means is, um, if you want to grow potatoes in Bow Island, which is a relatively high value crop that's a human food, uh, you'll need a lot of water. And what you can do is you can buy the water license from someone, for example, in the foothills, in the Cardston area, who might have been flood irrigating alfalfa. And so what we expect to happen um, with a finite resource, a finite and declining resource, is that there's going to be a change in the cropping patterns. Um, and it will be towards higher value crops, it'll be towards food crops, um, a lot of legumes, pulses, um, and I, I think that's likely to happen. There is some planning, there is active um, uh, programs underway by Alberta Environment and all Alberta Agriculture to try to project what the future water resources are going to be and to try to stay within those. Now relative to water for us, Relative to drinking and cooking water, there's a lot. So it, it will be that by far the primary consumptive water user in southern Alberta is irrigation. Um, there are going to be changes in irrigation relative to the cropping patterns. But reservoirs, shouldn't we be building reservoirs? Well, um, part of the I reason mean, the is... 20 to 50 year time scale. I don't see any thought, any planning going into it. We know there's going to be a problem, but are we planning that far ahead. Yes, absolutely. Um, and in fact, I've participated quite actively in a cluster of um, projects, again, led by the province, Alberta Environment especially, um, future gazing, what are the water supply situations going to be, what are the demand situations going to be 20 years, 50 years ahead. Relative to more dams, more reservoirs, the problem is we've already selected the best sites and virtually all of the rivers in southern Alberta are already extensively um, trapped. Now what that means is in an average or low flow year there's no more water coming down. There are in high flow years but the cost, the economic and, and environmental cost of building massive reservoirs for carryover multiple years is, is currently not really um, favorable. So yes people are thinking about it. There are going to be some changes. Um, I think we'll do okay in, in, within a 20 year time frame. Um, and as I say, there are people thinking about it, but the points you raise are absolutely critical. Thank you. Thank you. Question here. Hi. My question is in regards to communication and having those conversations with family members or friends. Um, and I, I liked your um, analogy, Hester, of forest fires, you know, talking about lightning um, and then you know, campfires or cigarette smokes. Robert, I, I appreciated your comments on making sure that the terminology 
is, is such that we, the layperson can understand. Um, a few weeks back, Gwyn Dyer was in town, and when he spoke about the incremental um, degrees, uh, increasing degrees, he, he, be, he used an analogy of, um, you know, if your child had a temperature, when would you get them to emergency? So my question is this. Are there analogies that you can use to really explain specifically, and Stuart, you alluded uh, to the difference between weather and climate, but are there down-to-earth, everyday experience analogies that can be used to really describe the state of the crisis and to motivate people to, to really help everyone just understand where things are at? I mean, we've talked about a lot of science here tonight, very interesting, but in terms of um, really applying it to your, your everyday life and, and seeing the crisis. So what analogies could be used to really communicate the crisis? Go ahead, Shannon. Um, I'm sorry I don't have a good analogy for you, but what I would suggest if you want to talk to people is to tell them why you care. Tell them what your personal story is and why you want to do something about it. And that those personal stories are a lot more effective than facts and science. And um, that's, that's been proven in, in lots of social science research is that we need to tell people why we care, tell our story, and then people will, will see that passion and that um, connection and, and they will respond to that. Um, and um, and then the, the other thing I would do is that as, if people wanted to d debate climate change, I would say, um, you know, if it becomes contentious or, or too much, I would say, let's shift gears and not talk about climate change for a second. Instead, tell me what you care about. Tell me what the th issues are that, that are keeping you up at night and go from there and then connect to those things instead of climate change. If, if, they're, you know, if they have no job because they lost their job in the oil patch, talk about that. Talk about how that, um, may, you know, maybe how they could get a, a new job in, in a, a low carbon economy or a, a green job or something. It has to be, um, give, give them a chance to talk as well. Bryson, you had a follow-up? Yeah, just, just a, a, a story that, that comes up that's in the neighborhood and, and might be helpful in some cases to explain, in a sense, uh, the respect in which we need cooperation internationally and, and in terms of our own politics to, to solve these problems. And it's, it's a story that economists tell. It's called the tragedy of the commons. I'm sure some of you have heard it, but it's a situation that, that arises in a traditional village where there's a commons for grazing and people put cows on the commons to graze and they benefit from the milk and the meat that the cows produce. And, uh, and everyone recognizes that, you know, if I just put one more cow on the pasture there, um, I'll be better off. Um, and, but the trouble is if everybody keeps on doing that for a little while, Pretty soon the commons is not very productive and the grass is all chewed down to the ground and uh, your cows are starving. Uh, so the, the, the moral of the story is, for some economists, that you need private ownership of the commons so that someone will protect it. Um, but there are other ways to do it and, and one way to do it is, is with a kind of social, legal sort of control on what access to the resource each person is being granted, and that sort of relates to the point I made earlier about our level of responsibility for the current state of the climate and the level of consumption that we're still engaging in. We've, we've eaten up more than our share of the commons when it, comes to, when it comes to that globally. Thank you. Question? Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. It has been very interesting. Um, to answer a question that you have asked, 
what you need to do to reach the public. And if I may, what is needed is confidence. You do not gain the confidence of the public when you make statements that they cannot be backed up by science. Someone mentioned that only non-scientists are non-believers. Now, I am a believer because I know CO2 does cause warming, but there is more to it. The climate is the most complex dynamic system we have ever encountered. It is so complex that we still don't know it and we don't have the means to compute it or simulate it. And I have simulated computers and I have simulated very complex systems that run for the last four years. So in order to get the confidence of the public, you have to provide proof of your statements. For instance, a statement that the computers' models are very reliable, it is not true, and everybody can tell that the IPCC publishes that they limit themselves to 20 years only. They can see that models differ between them for 15 degrees C, and they predict 0.01 degree for a year, which the error, the noise is more than the value. They can see when you say that the, all these uh, cl climatic problems that we have, fires and so forth, it is human cause that nobody knows. We assume it, but really nobody has provided a proof that this is what is happening. Nobody has provided a proof that the CO2 controls the Earth's thermostat. So, after I spoke to you, Dr. Brown, it was eight years ago, I started a study. 20,000, I'm a scientist, I have a master's in engineering in controls, thermofluids, system dynamics, and thermodynamics. After two, and I have written a program that simulates a complete nuclear reactor that operators are training on it today. I spent 20,000 hours, 18 to 20,000 hours, looking at those things, and I have not found the evidence yet that the CO2 controls the Earth's thermostat. If that is not the case, there are, th uh, there are hundreds of different mechanisms that control the Earth's temperature. How did we zoom into that one without analyzing how is the Earth cooling? Now, you mentioned that the uh, the cooling we had in February, it's, it's valid that argument that if it is very cool, it doesn't mean that it is it not the warming because the earth, the atmosphere dissipates the energy it has absorbed and that energy can be stored in currents, in kinetic energy, in potential energy, all kinds of things, and eventually has to dissipate it. So the dissipation brings the cold and I agree with you on that. But there are so many things that there are there. So unless you can back them up. And try, I know it is very difficult, it's very complex. It took me a lot of time to figure these things out. But in order to gain credibility for the people, you don't dictate it. You don't uh, in, in, indoctrinate people. You got to convince them, and convince them takes logic. And if you as a Call logician, it. I find that's often but, not the case, but... <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, what, your question? And the question is, where and when and how will the, uh, the proof is going to come this point? A, that those uh, 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 climatic uh, uh, disturbances we see are caused by human beings. Nobody has proven that. There is no scientific evidence. There are only assumptions. And two, I'm making a second statement, no one has proven that the CO2 controls the Earth's thermostat. So how can we go ahead? Well, I have the proof. Can I answer this? Yes, yes. go ahead. Hester. So the proof is not in the computer models. The proof is actually in the climate that we get from the ice cores. So the ice cores capture of the last 800,000 years, 
Every single year, the atmospheric chemistry, including the fluctuations of the CO2 and other greenhouse gases and other gases, as well as the climate itself. And from that, we have learned, first of all, that CO2 has about one third of an influence on the climate variation. So that is evidence that is not from, from computers, but directly from the ice cores. The second thing we've learned is that our influence on increasing the greenhouse gases has now uh, increased so much that we are so much above the natural variability that we haven't actually seen this. In fact, in 15 million years, we haven't seen this high an amount of CO2. Natural variability. Sorry? You say natural variability. Yes. So there's natural variability that is still there. On top of that, we've put so much CO2 and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. and. There is clear evidence. There's many papers that I can show you. There is evidence for that. Could you please Thank you. We'll have to take your telephone then, and maybe Th you can solve my Thank problem. Thank you for the question. We'll move on to the next, the last question for tonight. Hello. Thank you, everyone, um, for the wonderful talk. Um, I have, <laughs> as I stand here, I have more and more questions, but I'll try and keep it Come relatively on. brief. Um, we talk a lot about energy and those changes, but how can changes to things such as agriculture um, affect climate change? So new technologies such as aqua um, cultures, um, lab-grown meat and leather, um, th things like that. How are those kind of new technologies and how can we change um, those different things and how we are producing um, other things other than just energy. Anyone want to pick that, Rob? Um, well, the, the f first thing I would say is that I don't think that lab-grown meat is an environmentally sustainable solution. Um, if you look at the inputs that it takes to actually grow cells in the lab, you have to feed them, and um, it takes a lot of energy to generate the, the nutrients to maintain those cultures. Um, so I guess I'll just say I don't think lab-grown meat is green, um, but I guess I, I lost my train of thought as to what the question um, was. Can I add something to that? Like, so, like, changing different agriculture and things like that, so, like, um, could it also be um, things like changing also, um, like, the amount of, um, like, cattle and things like that? Like, is there a difference between, like, bison and cattle in their um, emissions? Um, I think from what I've seen from uh, going around uh, internationally to other colleagues, there's, there is a lot of work going into increasing the efficiency of things like aquaculture, um, which are much more efficient in converting their feed into meat. So I think we will see a shift towards um, these other types of meats. Grayson, you wanted to follow up, and that will be our last I'm comment. Sure some of us here have tried the Beyond Meat Burger at A and W, not to be advertising, but um, and and I think they've got a sausage patty now too for their breakfast sandwiches, and and those are those are not um, cultured meat; those are um, plant-based meat simulations, effectively. And and I can say that you know, as, as hamburgers go, they taste pretty good. <laughs> I must say, as a vegetarian, I'm not looking for meat replacers. I'm not missing the meat. So you can totally do it without those artificial meat-flavored products. Sorry, I'm Our, just going to... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I, yeah. I know. I know you're saying the last last. I know. Comments. No one seems to listen to me. Anymore, so. <laughs> go ahead. Um, so again, one of the really cool things that, that I get to do in my job is I get to hang out with different people working in different sectors that are all coming together in climate change. It's that, that systems-based perspective of climate change. So there's people who are looking at diversifying cropland into 
uh, so like from monoculture into this multiple plant-based or plant fields, right, pastures. And from what I've seen, from reports that I've read and papers that I've seen, is that native grasslands sequester more carbon than the boreal forest. And yet we're still cutting down on our native grasslands here in Alberta. We're still pushing for this agriculture, for this monoculture. And I've also heard that in about 60 to 70 years, we're gonna be losing our topsoil and our topsoil is what holds all our nutrients for our crops because we're investing so much into this monoculture. And yet people, farmers, and, and I mean, and I, I, again, I get it, it's the economy, but again, we do have to start looking at that diversifying. We have to start looking at what, what are we doing to sequester the carbon into our own ground? What are we doing to hang on to that topsoil? There's only you know, so much irrigation we can do until we're running low on water. So, so yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. And what are we doing with agriculture right now? And what can we look to in the future? What kind of future vision can we have for our agriculture lands right now while still trying to feed the population of the world? That's also a really big question. Stu, did you have a comment? Uh, actually, a uh, response to about the last six or eight questions or comments. Um, and hopefully leaving you with something a bit more um, encouraging. Relative to the climate change challenge that we face, to some extent it somewhat um, resembles three prior challenges that we faced globally. Um, the first was ozone depletion with chlorofluoropropellants. And there was the Montreal Accord. Um, the nations got together. And while it wasn't absolute proof, the there was enough certainty that, that there was an agreement that we need to do something. Um, we still have aerosols that we use, but with different propellants, and the ozone hole, especially over um, the southern area that was leading to high levels of skin cancer in New Zealand, has been closed. Um, acid rain in southern Ontario and uh, New England, uh, US, um, by changing scrubbers and stacks was very effective. And so the Canadian Shield and the other granite systems have rebounded quite nicely. And then subsequently, removing phosphorus from detergent. So we need the science with enough certainty to have some reasonable path forward. And I am hopeful that based on those three that were transnational and even global concerns, hopefully we'll be able to do something similar relative to carbon dioxide and climate change. Thank you, Stu. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the panelists, and thanks for all those questions, and thanks for the ongoing thought. So with this, we, we close tonight's session, and hopefully we provide a location at the university for more of these sorts of conversations. So thank you very much, everyone.